Hey guys, we're live, live. Hope you're all fine. This is Gio from Smart Home Makers and welcome to March. We have another live stream. We have another guest. It's nice to see you all. I hope you're all fine, you're all good. Little bit of a new setup here. I've tried to got this little microphone set up. I've been breaking my neck over the weekend, trying to get this bookcase up. A little bit of LEDs light, so you'll find a little bit of an improvement in the background. Um, also to see some comments already in the chat. We've got uh, Hi Robert, Nicolas, uh, Rasby, we've got Sunshine, uh, and we've got the man himself, uh, Chris, uh, which he's, we're gonna get him on now. Uh, he's warming up in the backstage, I can see him, he's, he's firing up, he's ready to go. Um, so we'll be talking today about uh, smart home tech, home assistant, anything. We've had a new release very recently, so might expect maybe to talk about that if you guys want to. Um, recent videos that have been published by either myself or any of the other YouTubers around Home Assistant, projects you're working on. So we want to really hear it all. So remember to submit all of your questions down here. We'll go one by one. And obviously someone wants to jump the queue, they can use the super chat and they will jump the queue. But we're going to try and follow a queue and hopefully if we miss if we do miss you, just let us know and just ping again and, and you know, hopefully we don't miss any comments down the line. Uh, it's nice to see you, uh, Esteban also, and uh, nice to see Matteo also. So let's bring in the man himself, Chris. Hey, hey. You're, you're live. I'm Welcome. live. Woo. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Well, thanks for having me. So. so introduce yourself then introduce right? myself uh, my name is chris gaysford um i do a little bit of the youtubes um as people would call them um i'm not very good yet but i'm definitely just getting started and i hope that one day i'll have very good videos such as geo himself here <laughs> but uh, no i'm excited to be here I, I i'm a big fan of automation and i've that's kind of been driven through my work life but then I've kind of brought that home with me and that's kind of how one of the reasons I have the passion that I do to automate my home so that's awesome that's awesome so what sort of uh gadgets what sort of uh system you have you run home assistant right like like I have 
Yep, yep. Um, definitely Home Assistant. Um, I, I was a big fan from Home Assistant right from the start, just because it is Python based. Um, mm -hmm. I've mentioned it to you, but I am a big fan of Python, and it's kind of what I've used as my primary coding language when I've needed to write scripts or anything like that in the past. So the fact that it was open sourced, Python based was a big plus to me. So I definitely yeah. lean that way. Um, I know there's a few other ones out on the market, but mostly because like either they weren't, they didn't have as big of communities. So like the integration support was limited or um, you didn't have as much flexibility as far as like custom integrations and stuff, stuff like that is yeah. what ended up leading me to the Home Assistant itself, so. I mean, the pace of change with Home Assistant is awesome. It, it, they just um, improve and iterate over and over and, and they give new features each, each month, basically. You can look forward to new stuff. Right, uh, yeah. I, I was kind of wondering that because they used to do like um, every quarter. It would be a quarterly release, but mm -hmm. it just feels like every time I get it, go into Home Assistant, I have an update pending now. So it's just crazy. <laughs> they really just started to churn it out. Well, they're working really hard. I think they've hired also a few, some new developers in terms of the Nabucasa team. Right, uh, and I think, I think that has helped a lot with them offering some sort of way to actually get some funding in the bank, so. Yeah, because you go think how they get all funded, right? Long right. term, and, and is it going to continue uh, or, or not? So what sort of, um, what's, I think your latest video coming from is around zones. So maybe we right. start talking about zones a bit and see if anyone's got some cool zone, zone automations anywhere I can actually talk about. So, I mean, like, like I mentioned in my video, um, I was very scared to actually get into zones. I don't know why, and it was definitely pre the mobile app integration days. Um, I didn't really see a purpose in it. I just, it didn't make any sense. Why would I classify somewhere on a map, um, especially when my home assistant's always home. And yeah. um, I think with the rollout of their official mobile app, which actually can track where you are and see your longitude and latitude and actually see whether you're in or out of these zones, it adds a lot of flexibility as far as using the broad emissions now, because now when I leave my home, I could have my Simply Safe security system turn on or like if i get to my house i can have my doors unlocked for me so if i'm carrying groceries i don't have to try and unlock the door and so just stuff like that there's just been a lot of cool things added with zones and um i don't know i just definitely pairing them with the mobile device just makes sense to me i, I can't really see use case for them outside of that yeah i mean uh, next one is also to start devising you can start tracking like cars and things like that i guess or if you have a dog that goes out, right? I mean, you start with... Start with you know, that, that that is kind of a crazy <laughs> idea. I mean, I'm sure it would be definitely possible to just get like a, yeah, you know, OBC something and plug it into your car and have it connect to a cell phone tower and track where your car is at. That'd be crazy. I mean, so how do you come up with automation ideas? Where, where do you like, is it something that you just oh. Like, oh, say, oh, this is really boring me. I want to create an automation or how, how does it come to you? See, and I wish, I wish I was better about it, to be honest, because like, if you look at my channel, it's, it's very last lucker, last, it, it doesn't have very many automations at all. And it's just because like, I, I don't have like those light bulb moments. I have frustrations with my life and, and that's usually what I tend to automate. Like, man, I, I can't turn off the lights while I'm in bed. Need an automation for that, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you yeah, find that sometimes so. the automation actually does something that you don't want to do. Do you find uh, that sometimes? Yeah, no, I mean, not in my current setup because I'm at a new house now and I've, I, I'm still building up to where I used to be in my old home. Um, but my old home was just this little rickety, um, oh, I love that place, but it was, it was falling over all over the place, but we actually had like this weird part of the house. So from the master bedroom going through, like we called it the apartment, but really it was just the add on that happened to be there. Okay. Um, there was just this spot of the house that you had to go through to get to the backyard. And, and so what I, I made it so when you open the door, um, it, the lights would turn on. But I wanted, but like you close the door and you don't want the lights to turn off instantly, you know? Yeah. So I set like a timer and it was like a five minute timer or something, which was great because you open, you go up there, let the dogs outside, whatever, you know? 
and come back inside. The lights eventually just turn off. But when we started um, remodeling our master bathroom, we started to use the bathroom in this add-on. And you'd be in the middle of like taking a shower or something. And next thing you know, all the lights just turn off and you're like, <laughs> You're well, like waving like this, right? You're trying to like, come on. Yeah, you're like doing the clap, you know, <laughs> no. um, but you're like trying to just scream out over the shower. Hey, Google. Hey, Google. <laughs> Turn on the lights. <laughs> and, and now everyone's devices have, have started triggering now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, I, I apologize. Hey, G. Hey, G should have been the way to go there yeah, but that's fine that's fine that's fine i haven't got one here last time in in my last live we were doing a quiz i don't know if you caught up on it and you saw the yeah i know i did see it so doing this quiz and there was a question with the with apple's voice assistant right and and, the, and there was a question about it so i said the name and as soon right. as i said that name i've got a couple of ios devices here they all triggered and they all do, do, do. and the question was what 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 brand you know it is and and they all gave it all away and, and i started laughing because i was like it's quite embarrassed because i was like oh <laughs> what do you do something sometimes right. like this in live live stream things like that happen um so i got, i've got an interesting one and um, i was thinking about in terms of a uh, new automation to do so um i was looking at these cameras and looking at doing some external, we call it CCTV in the UK. Do you call it, do you say CCTV or camera surveillance? Um, I mean, CCTV is uh, like kind of like the proper term. A lot of people just say security system or like yeah. security cameras. Um, I don't see a whole lot of people referring to it as CCTV anymore. So, so I got, I got a actual um, Ethernet cable ready to run some POE, a POE camera. So oh, yeah. I, had that, I had that pre-cabled. And if I was thinking next week, I might get someone in to actually put a camera in and, you know, and overlook my car. Oh, you could do that. I believe in you. I could do it, but this is, um, it's the drilling part that I'm like, I need to drill from external wall into internal wall. I can, oh, I, I, I believe in you. I, I've done it. I need to get this big drill out and drill oh, out. Baby. Oh, actually, well, since we're talking about it, two seconds. <laughs> So what you're saying is you bought some of like these guys. Well, yeah. Well, to be fair, they've um, they've reached out and they wanted uh, me to uh, do a video about them. Oh, so, okay. Um, they think so. When you're in that process, you're thinking of, hey, what do I do with this camera? Do I need the camera? What, what is the use case? Or is it just a right. gadget, right? And and the idea is. Um, I thought, what, what, what is my main pain point with my parking spot? Am I concerned that someone's going to steal my car? Maybe, but even if I <laughs> capture it, they've gone already, right? Right. So one of the main problems we have where I live is, is, is people parking out in other people's bay. I don't know if you know. So you have an allocated right, space. Right, right. Someone just um, parks in your own space. They go off somewhere and you yeah. come home and you're like, oh, someone's a car's in my spot, right? Right. And you called in the UK, you call the police, the police are going to tell you that, you know, then it's not going to be a priority, right? So you're stuck basically with, with, you don't know where you put your car. Um, so I'm thinking, what can I do? I can do one of those. It's an excuse for me to play with number plate recognition. Right. I've seen other videos on YouTube, other YouTubers have, have, have done number plate recognition. So I could theoretically say, if, 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 if it recognizes a number plate, that's not my number plate to send me a notification or whatever, right? To, to say, Hey, man, you, uh, then you hook it up to a speaker and you say, Hey, get out of my spot. Hey, hey, get out of my spot. Right. You know, please do not park it. Now, maybe in Britain we would say, please, uh, we would, <laughs> you kindly reminded not to park in this. <laughs> man, so you are way too nice. If somebody was parking in my, my spot, <laughs> I, I would be getting on them set up a little water balloon launcher with paint, just whoosh. So I have a lot of people um, that I talk to around here that have a similar problem. And they're probably not into smart homes, they're not into tech gadgets. But if I were to approach them and say, hey, I've got, if, if, I, if I do this for you, you're gonna have this benefit. 
people are gonna start thinking, hey, this is cool tech. This is cool tech. I want right. to use it. They see a use for it because a lot of people just see um, they see just technical things. They don't know what they can do with home assistant. They see smart home stuff and yeah, camera. Okay, understand. I can turn my light on and off my phone. Right. How do I how do I glue it all together? So you, the way I think of it, and that's what I'm trying to do with talking with you guys. Man, you're trying to you're trying to convert people, bring them I'm into convert people into because I know probably everyone here that's watching is already converted. They're probably um, they're probably you know big big uh, fans of it, right? So there's no need for that. Right. It's trying to get more people on board in and seeing it how valuable it can be similar to that the, the video i made around the uh, uh the garage or doorbell did you see that video of the doorbell? Right. yeah yeah that was um this monday right yeah so that was like you know someone not someone's pressed the doorbell and then you can then get that notification and open the garage door or not so you, you get what i mean you 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 can potentially open your garage or if you wanted to or, right yeah or, no, or that, security yeah. box right it's more of a use case of seeing how you can combine two uh basically shelly device and nest that don't right. talk to each other necessarily and you can make it make something out of it right and i, I think that's where for a lot of people really does start to click as soon as you could go oh i i just did this and then this happened because of that, that there's like a chain reaction and they're like whoa that's pretty cool like i get home and not only it's my door now unlocked but now like the main kitchen light is on so i i don't have to like turn on the lights or do anything like that you know and so i think i think that's when people definitely do start to like want to actually like dive into it more but as far as like converting people you only need to convert one person in the home because I don't know about your wife, how she has um, accepted the home automation, but I know like everybody I know that's into it, they're the only ones in that household that cares about it, that their family just puts up with it. I, I guess like you could think who, I mean, you would, you would think, would I be able to do that video, right? Who is that person knocking on that door? Was it a random person? Did you think it was a random person or did you think that was obviously staged? Because obviously it was staged. I'm yeah, kidding. no, I mean, I, I felt like it was staged, but I mean, I came to, I, I watched it under under the context that, oh, he, he's making a video, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and, and that is, she, that's that's my wife. The person that was actually knocking on the door is my wife, right? So um, she's, uh, I don't know, probably she's watching this upstairs or watching Netflix and not interested at all in the stream, which is potentially uh, what is actually happening um but no um i i think i think this is a, a big thing and a big thing i'm going to talk about uh next week next week i'm planning to do some a little bit of a workshop to and get everyone that's live involved um and to get more people how do you get your whole family on board with home automation ideally before you get into it before you transform your whole house and uh, how do you get buy-in and how do you make it work for everyone uh, right. and, and then what is the difference between it being a hobby and being something that we just playing around and enjoying to actually being something that becomes critical, becomes like a utility, something that like right. broadband, electricity, gas gets to that point that you rely on it, not just um, I'm playing a bit here and there. Right, it's right. Like, no, I, 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 but I don't think it's completely um, out of the question for it to be like that. I mean five, 10 years ago, if you at home didn't have internet, it's like, oh, you know, like that's whatever. But we're, we now live in a day and age where like internet is a requirement for the, um, for almost everything nowadays, you know? And so I, I think like, just kind of like with everything, um, we're, it's right now going through its paces, you know, a bunch of hobbyists have it and they're playing with it. Um, but eventually it'll get to a point where it's like, oh, when I pull up to my house, my garage door autom automatically opens. Like there's just, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have a button to open my garage. Like how do I open my garage without it? You know? Yeah, I agree. I, Chris, are you ready to dive into some questions? Look at the comment section. Oh, uh, we've, got totally. a few, we've got a few down there and um, just wanted to have a, a good chat with you. And then now we can uh, delve into it. 
and we can start uh, delving into some questions. So I think we've got first first one here from Robert. This was done before before the live. So thank you, Robert, for uh, getting in early. And so question is, can you talk about templates and smart ways to reduce the size of automations? So um, I'll definitely try to talk about the templates. As far as the size of automations go, um, I'm a little bit torn. Um, obviously, once you start having your automations do things and um, they, they're going to start to grow. And there's a few different ways you can actually like kind of get them down through like some smart assistant scripts and stuff like that, where you start templating um, kind of your automations. I shouldn't use templating here because it's a different context, but kind of like where you're kind of making like a playbook of your automations. And so then when you're actually building out your automations, you can just refer to those scripts. Um, so that might be the best way to reduce the size of the automations. I mean, to a certain extent, they're going to be the size that they are. Um, they're not like typically crazy big as far as size goes, like kilobytes and bytes and stuff like that. Um, but they can definitely get lengthy. And so I wonder if the size, Robert, I don't know if you want to comment again, but um, if the size is the reference of the lines of code or, or, or if it's like, um, yeah. Right, and and that that's the only way I, I'm gonna take try to answer it for at least for right now. Um, but like, so you, if you're using like um, scripts inside Home Assistant, they're a lot like functions if you've ever written code and used reusable code. So that's a lot like what the scripts are, and you could actually call those scripts from inside your automations. So like, I could have a script that says, "Hey, turn off all the lights in my home." and lock all my doors and then i could have an automation that says hey when i leave home call the light script call the door script and so that way your automation is hugely reduced um and that but they're just reusable bits of code that you can use other places now yeah i think that's an awesome idea it's a really good point and i i think also a lot of the time is reducing clutter how do you uh, get rid of the automation and that don't really work the ones you may be disabled and, and clean up a bit. Um, it's, it's an interesting point. How do you make it? How do you then make sense of what's happening? It's, it's easy to lose control. Uh, I found it with my own situation. I lost control after like, I'm out. I wiped it out and start, I'm starting again and I'm actually recording the whole process behind the scenes. It's taking, it's taking a lot of effort, but um, and now I'm saying, hey, I need to find a way of fight, figuring this out um so that it doesn't get to a mess especially with doing videos you do you do you doing automations for videos and sometimes you're doing it for the videos and then you're like thinking uh, you know you got all of these automations and it starts cluttering you right? it slows you down to try it's, it's a difficult task um cool i think let's move on to the next uh we have uh, oh, I, wa I was going to touch on the, the templates for him, though. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We haven't touched on that. What were you doing? <laughs> I started off with the automations because I felt like it was the easier one to answer. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can actually share my screen here. Yeah, sure. Let's see. And we'll, we'll, this uh, was this was something we didn't actually test, so. Well, we're fine. We'll test it now. <laughs> we're going to do it live, right? I think I need to allow something on my computer here. Do, 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 do. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen? It should just be. A... Yeah, oh, I think okay. it, I think it's us again. You're okay, sure. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay. So inside of Home Assistant here, I've, I've tried to um, increase my text size. So hopefully it's a lot easier to read from the stream and the video. Um, so templates, um, they're kind of like these you know, more advanced feature of Home Assistant. Um, basically, um, it, this is a templating right here. And it's kind of a mess, but basically all this turns into something readable. Like over here, you have your output here. And maybe my screen is a bit too zoomed in there. But, um, but the, the main idea of templating is it gives you um, writable code to where you can start um, making your own type of sensors. So a good way to think about it is like if you're looking at your states, um, I have the weather.home pulled up here with all these states laid out. This is a huge type of thing, but 
me, I might only care about the temperature of it outside, you know, maybe the wind speed and stuff like that. I don't need access to all of this, right? And these templates, they're basically just Python code. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, Home Assistant is just Python basically on steroids. Um, and like, so if I were to take out like all these templating features and like this right here, this is a Python dictionary, you know? And like these right here, these are just like variables that you'd have inside your Python. Um, obviously it's not pure Python because it's in the Jinga, Jinja, Jinga 2 template engine. Um, but that's kind of the main idea. Um, you're going to see this a lot if you're into IT and doing stuff like that. Um, Ansible, which is a huge Python automation language, is written inside the Jinja 2 template engine as well. Um, but like even here, they're pulling out the home is sunny from inside the states over here. So that's kind of like it from above. Um, and if you're taking a look at the documentation for the home assistant templating, um, there's a huge amount here. You can build custom sensors um, and you can, so like, let's say you had a sensor that told you, let's, let's continue with the weather because we can actually see some of the numbers here. Um, you could actually see the temperature outside is 67. And so maybe you wanted to have a car that would say jacket or no jacket weather. And that's all you wanted the car to do. You didn't want it to actually show 67. You could build a custom sensor to do that using some YAML. But inside of here, you could actually extract stuff. Um, you could see sensor states. Um, so you could see if somebody's home or not. Um, and so just kind of to play with that a little bit more, I'm gonna go ahead and grab like the state adder um, function here. And then we'll come over here and we'll just kind of modify this. So um, let's go ahead and take all this out. And so what they've done here is they're looping through states weather. So the idea is if, if you have a home, if you have a work, and if you have a few different locations here um, that would be reporting some sort of weather, um, you'd actually get a list here. The home is sunny, the work is sunny, and stuff like that. And so th that's what they're doing here. And this, this, these little curly brackets and parentheses here, this is the Junja 2 template. Um, basically just exposing it to this code block or this template editor here as however you want to call it. So if I was going to modify, so if you have something like this, it's usually referring to some sort of Python function. So for state in state.weather, that's a very Python type of statement where you, you want to do a loop. Um, and then down here you see it again with the if, if else, and else block. But then down here, they have just the double curly brackets to expose the variables. And so I think this is how a lot of people will probably end up using it, is by doing the curly brackets. So if we do the curly brackets here, um, it takes it, turns it to not text. So all right, it turns it into code. So if up here I just have, this is text, and it's not going to render it because I have an empty brackets here. But if I have this is text, it is just plain text that is being passed through. Um, but if I go ahead and hop over to start templating and using that Jinja 2 layout stuff, and I open this up and I'm gonna go ahead and use that some adder attribute or function provided by Home Assistant. And now inside of here, I could go ahead and start pulling some stuff out. And this one actually takes the state and what you're looking for. Um, so in our case, it would probably be Weather home. Actually, type here, and maybe I guess we'll just go and grab one of these guys. And so now we can see that the temperature inside of weather home is sixty six point two. So I could build sensors around this and have it either show that. Um, basically, I could use the templates to extract that data um, out of the state object. So when you have like stuff like this that are huge, um, it's going to be a little bit overwhelming, and maybe it's just not what you're looking for, um, especially when you're displaying cards on like your home screen here. You want them to be very straight to the point. So sunny, home, temperature, stuff like that. This is done through like templating. And I, I don't know if that's like overall the best way to explain it, but I feel like that's going to be 
hopefully that's easy enough to understand. Guys, I thought that was an amazing um, explanation. Thanks for that, Chris. And it's actual right time to say that you can actually like and subscribe this stream, but also go over to his channel because I'm pretty sure we'll have uh, some of these awesome uh, tutorials to come. Thanks, thanks, Chris, for that. Oh yeah, now now uh, now I'm gonna have to do one. So, well, we can I can clip this and, and we'll see what we can do. You could you could we can uh, re redo it again, but wow. no, but it's uh, that's that's really cool. I feel it's 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 something that makes the platform really powerful. No, it definitely does, and um, like I mentioned earlier, like that was one of the reasons that I do think Home Assistant is just cool because it allows you to do kind of like these custom ideas with it. Um, mm -hmm. My boss, who's um, a long time tech nerd from long before I was ever born, but he he's really deep into the home assistant realm. And he has like a lot of this old technology that um, long before like integrations to home assistant even happened, you know? Yeah. Like, um, I mentioned to you, but he has like a pond in his backyard and he's actually like building sensors um, to put into his pond so that way he can monitor it through his home assistant type of stuff. And mm -hmm. so like just having that ability and the flexibility to actually create your own stuff if there's not a product out there for it, um, I think that's definitely where home assistant starts to shine for um, at least the nerds of the world. So, Cool. So we got, uh, so as I said, uh, Nicholas said one, so I think he's the, was the first on the live. So thanks for your the comment. Uh, we have Raspi, we uh, it's nice to make it the live stream. Awesome, it's good. Uh, There's gonna be one next week. Um, so same time, I'm not sure what day, probably towards the end of the week. Um, we have a uh, random comment, uh, Esteban. Uh, so, okay, we've got a question here. So he's saying, hello, I'm in need uh, to make an irrigation plan based on weather. I figured out how to make it work based on past conditions, but not based on forecast. Okay. So this could be pretty linked to what we were talking, uh, looking at earlier, right? With the, um, uh, sure, sure. So you probably um, need the right API. So yeah. there's definitely APIs out there that would do it. I mean, so you have like your dark sky APIs and your that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that would do some sort of forecasting. Um, I mean, depending on how far out you really need to go and how correct you need that data. Um, here, let me just reshare the screen again here. But inside of here, or that state, let's jump back over to the developer tools and we'll pull up, oh, it's still pulled up. Um, but inside of the state, it actually does offer some forecast. Yeah, the forecast, there it is. Um, and I don't, I've never played with these. I've never needed to look at any of these at all. So I don't know how accurate they are, but you might be able to pull from that just out of the box. Um, I'm somebody where um, in the past I've used dark sky and APIs like that. So I, I feel would probably feel pretty comfortable using those if I was going to build something to look at that forecast. Um, I don't know. I feel like, especially for a lot of people, like when they do their automations, it's very like, in this moment, it's either sunny or not. Do something based off that knowledge. Um, mm. So I'd be interested interested to know what Esteban is doing with trying to forecast the weather for his automation. So, yeah, I guess you could also calculate how much rain you could store, how much rain has has come down, and then make a decision if your if your plants need watering or not. And I am not a good. You might remember from one of my earlier videos that this plant. It's not really good in good shape and nowadays so that's why i'm not there not it's not in the videos anymore uh, so i'm not <laughs> good on that but technically you could if you wanted to store that information store information and and make decisions based on that right and so like yeah i mean it, he does mention irrigation plan here so maybe that was kind of naive for me to mention but um yeah no uh yeah so i that would be the main thing like if it rained if, if it's going to rain today, don't turn on my sprinklers right now, maybe type of forecasting is what he's looking for. Um, but I do think probably looking at an external API of some sort, maybe the dark sky stuff, and they might even have an integration that's one of the more popular um, services out there that offer an API. So I would definitely look at that, Mr. Esteban. Cool. 
Um, so we got, I think we got Nikolas. He's got a, uh, he's saying he's bought his first Nest uh, Mini today. He's excited to get it integrated with Home Assistant. Well, I think good luck. It's, it's one of the most, dif most difficult integrations um, that I don't know why Google's made it so difficult. So, to an API, but um, all I you, <laughs> have you tried it? I very much have tried it. I, I, I did it for probably about a year. And um, you have to go through this crazy Google developer console. Um, you got to basically build an app and have it basically open up that integration so that way your home assistant could talk to you the nest. Um, it's very, very complicated. And the worst part is like it will just die about every month or so where you actually have to go poke it and like rerun your test or whatever to like make it active again. And to actually like use your Nest devices or your Google speakers with that integration, <laughs> and well, that's why... the, the speakers nowadays they run. I get them integrated with. Uh, I think it's called Google Cast. So this is some the. But I have the Google um, before they were called Nest Minis. I think they're the same thing, right? Yes. So the the little puck, right? Right. The, right. So Google, that works on the Google Cast, which is fine. All the other the the doorbell and the camera that's well so I guess I guess there's a few different types of integrations you could be looking to do um, out of the box sure the Google casting stuff to devices work great um, I've definitely used it when I was playing with building out alarms a while back through my home assistant but um, for me where, where the integration really becomes useful is like something like let's say. Like I use the Nabu Casa integration to pair yeah, my yeah, device. Yeah. So now I can just say, hey, G, do this. And it'll actually interface with a device like lights or door that I have mm -hmm. in my home system. Yeah, that's the killer That's the killer feature. Basically, you know, that's taking it to the next level. When you can get the voice assistants to work, I think it adds a lot to your smart home. Right. And like, um, for, I think the Nabu Casa is like four or five bucks a month. But like... I've told people before, like to not have to go into that Google console every month and try to figure out how to get my integration back working is it's worth the five bucks a month. Like I would pay somebody just for to, to go do that for me. You know, I mean, I think if you're not technical, you should just leave it alone. Oh, that would be my advice because yeah. I made a video about this Nabucadza, the, the, you know, and it, it, it sparked good conversation around, you know, um, we can't put some people not comfortable paying for it many people are but ultimately I think if you're not technical you haven't got a chance to, to do it you could look at tutorials but right. you get it to work but then and, I mean, if it goes wrong you can't troubleshoot it you don't know what and to do like, since we're on the topic but just the fact that they open you up to remote UI with already SSL and all that type of stuff um, to me, that five bucks is just a huge time saver from headaches and stuff like that. Because sure, you can use the Let's Encrypt and stuff like that. Um, I've definitely made it work like that in the past. But in three months, when those certs expire, it, how it, it's you're gonna have to re basically re go through the process of setting it back up. So to me, using the Nabu Casa for either like your Nest Mini or anything like that is just gonna be like a very sturdy way to just do it indeed indeed that makes sense cool 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 i think he because i was saying he's uh interested in the irrigation system so that's cool so we've answered that um uh, uh, no he, i think i think he was asking for recommendations like what do you currently oh, have like a sprinkler system that you use no i have a very small little yard garden whatever so no i don't i don't uh, i, mean, I should add probably because no plants are not in good shape <laughs> but i think i think in the uk we might be blessed with good rain a good dose of rain so we might All not right. be too much in the need of uh, irrigation systems but uh so, i mean I'm to be wrong if anyone's from the uk let me know you might have an irrigation system so to to answer this question I'll, I'll take a stab at it i mean right now i've never done anything super fancy as far as irrigation systems go but i've dreamed about it having always had a, a yard um that i maintain um i've always dreamed about getting something that would tie into my home assistant and um if your just pocket is full of money and you 
don't want to get your hands dirty with trying to build out a custom integration, there's this um, company called Ranchero out there that offers a really elegant, clean solution that actually has a native um, Home Assistant integration. So that's what I would recommend if you want to actually buy a product to do it for you. Um, as far as like if you wanted to build out something yourself, I would recommend like doing like an ESP Home device and then using the ESP Home built-in integration to kind of like plug that into your current sprinkler system as is. Um, I think that if when I end up building one, because I do plan on doing one in the next year or so, I think that I'm going to go the ESP Home route. So cool. All right, we're going to look, we're going to look forward to that then. It's good. It's good. Have you got a nice? Got some good good outside space? Um, yeah, no, um, it, it's not bad. I think it's a quarter of an acre. Mm. So definitely enough yard for the dogs to run around and enjoy it. But it's also enough yard to like make it a hassle to want to maintain it. So <laughs> I'll feed you, I'll feed you. Uh, awesome. So ready to move on to the next one. Uh, I think it's around zones. Um, so Raspi is saying, I use zones a lot, but I had to make them really small and have a lot of overlapping to make sure they work correctly. So zones uh, seems to be a little bit uh, problematic here. Maybe. Um, I, I guess I, I would be interested to know in the use case, like how crazy you're getting with your zones um, and how many of them you have close together. Um, because I've never, I, I've used zones for a little while now, but it's always been pretty simple places. Like I've always done like my work. So when I'm at work, um, notify me if like the, something, op somebody opens the door and nobody should be at home and stuff like that. So I've used zones like that in the past. Um, I've always probably had less than three though. Um, just because like, there's not a lot of places I go outside my house and my work from the day to day stuff. So uh, no, I'd be interested in to know on the use case, but no, I've never really had that problem. So okay, Raspi, let, let us know down down in the comments. We'll, we'll sort of surely get to that. Um, okay, cool. So I think we have Esteban here. No, uh, he's he's, he's using a Wi-Fi smart valve because I wanted to know how he was doing it. Connected to a host sprinklers. Yeah. All right. So yeah. So basically, he's just wanting to know if it's going to rain that day. So as if it's going to rain, he doesn't water over water his plants. So that's also actually a good uh, use case to save uh, save you know the water. Yeah. Guess, well, right? yeah. Man. Yeah. No. My my fiance. She has a bunch of plants in her office. I'm not a big plant guy. Um, I, I tend. You know to a lot plant. about plants, right? I thought that's why. How do you how do you know all about it? Not, my fiance loves plants and. So I, I, yeah, no, if you overwater them, they, they will die. So I get it. <laughs> I, I, I get to that also, right? <laughs> okay. Um, have you got Miguel? Um, so he's asking the questions. He's saying, hi there. Did you trust any smart lock in order to put it on the front door integrated on Home Assistant? And uh, which one? Do you, do you want to go first, Chris? Sure. Um, and I actually have the one from my video sitting well, you've, here. You've got it just here, right? Are well, you actually, sure these questions are not prepared already? Right? Uh, well, I wasn't prepared, but um, <laughs> I actually have two Yell locks. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Yell as just like a company. And I mean, they're kind of like in bed with Google a little bit. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of um, Yell and doing all my research. They seem like really well built locks and stuff like that. So when I bought locks, I actually bought two of the Yale locks, and I currently have one on my front door. Um, this one's made for my garage door and the backyard and stuff, but I just haven't gotten around to ripping off whatever the old owners did. But yeah, no, I, I'm a big fan of Yale. Um, I've used them for about a year and a half now, and I've never had any problems. So Awesome. Um, I haven't got any smart locks yet. Uh, there is a brand uh, called Nuki, uh, N U I K I K. I, yeah, I think so. And they have these uh, very interesting uh, smart locks. I'm just trying to share my screen and see if you can see if we can get it up. Um, but there's a simple reason why I haven't done it. 
see if I can get it. Vision window. Okay. So I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, no, it's coming through. Let me expand a bit more. So this is the one I'm got my eye on. It, it apparently works with uh, Alexa, Google Assistant, HomeKit, and uh, Airbnb, right? If you're into that, so it sort of integrates, and it's like a little thing that sits. I don't know why there's all these. This <laughs> ah, here we go. You got an image of it. It's like a cylinder thing. So from the outside, it looks exactly the same. It doesn't look any different than a than a normal lock, and this sits in the inside. And I think I'm pretty sure if this is in uh, integration home system, let's see. It might be. Yeah. Oh, there it is, yeah. So we've got it here. So, and also it's got a good IoT class, which has got local polling. So it got, it's got smart locks and as you can control them, I have a software bridge no, or a physical bridge. It, right? it is cool that it has the local polling because that basically, um, turns it into, I mean, it's probably not going to be like a Z wave or something like that, but not having to send it out over the network just to mm. unlock your door. That, that, too, that's such a big pain. Like I mentioned it a few times in my videos where like, if you're using something like simply or, um, oh, uh, what are those sensors called the smart things? If you're using smart things, um, even though like you have your smart things hub here and you have everything here it still has to reach out to their servers and that's actually the biggest downside to me because like if their that's servers are down i can't control it, it even though i have all the hardware here yeah and that's that's it also you know big the big feature and that's one of the things that actually makes me not buy stuff anymore and, you know i i tend to look at that and say mm, you know um but it's certainly something that we need to look at the iot iot class over here um, so I'm really stop sharing yet. So the the thing, the only reason why I haven't bought it yet, is because it is very easy to open from the inside. So I have a I have a toddler, and he would be able to press a button, and the door would open, and he could potentially walk out. So there isn't a way to disable it. It's a it's a fire fire security feature. Uh, but, but because of I've got a traditional key, so I just lock it and put the key somewhere high above where he can't get to it. So that's a little bit of a problem we have. But um, as he as he grows, maybe we're not gonna he's not gonna right. run out on the road anymore. So 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 that that's the reason why. Not that he would, but you know, I guess. Right. Awesome. That was a good question. Good one. Let's uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, I think we have Keith, right? Keith, uh, it's nice to see. Nice to have you. Uh, any local communicating thermostats that aren't Z-Wave? Tired of Z-Wave? Okay, be interested to find out why are you tired uh, with Z-Wave. Yeah, no, I would. Uh, I would. Uh, I'm interested to hear that as well because I think Z-Wave is the one feature I look for when I'm looking for like local connectivity. Um, sure, I mean it might connect to the Wi-Fi and stuff like that, but like in my experience with like Wi-Fi lights and stuff like that, that are, they are just even on your own network is like, there's just a little bit of latency and I've, I've, I've never really understood why, but it always feels like the Wi-Fi stuff just aren't as responsive as the Z-Wave. Hmm. Yeah, let's see, Z, Z, I don't know if Keith is commenting down below, I'm not sure. Okay, we'll wait, we'll give him some time to, to but, um In terms of thermostats, do you use anything? I use the Google Nest. Um, yeah. I mean, and I, they used to tie into Home Assistant, but not anymore since all the API changes Google's made. And um, when they uh, moved Nest into the Google realm, they've kind of locked them down. Um, I think they recently changed that. Uh, I've, I've um, a couple of months ago managed to get it now back up and running. Oh, uh, yeah. I missed that in the in in home assistant but you need to pay a five dollar fee for the privilege to unlock to use the api it's, it's, it's really not that much but um uh, let me drop the if drop. it if it allows you to open it up to automations i think it'd be well worth the five bucks because oh, i, I was paid, like i paid for it immediately and because you, right. you had it already right so i'm not gonna 
buying them if I missed that. Right. And so like, yeah, I already have one in place. And like, um, for me, like the dream, as far as my thermostat goes, is like, I can have a temperature sensor somewhere in the house. And based on what that temperature sensor says, I could turn the heat on or off or something like that, you know? And that's always been the dream. And um, that's kind of the reason I was like, oh, I want to get the Google Nest. And I got it. And I've just the integration has gone away and I've just missed it. I've, and I, I it's almost, I've almost bought other ones that still have a home assistant integration, but again, I already have it. So I've, I've given you some good news because, um, it, it, I've, I've put the link there. It, it, it's a game. It's game changing. I was about to swap it out also to get something else. Cause it's like, Oh, come on. This is not integrating well. Um, other thing we have in the UK, we have radiator valves. I don't know if you know what radiator valves are. Um, radiator. They're like, we have radiator. Well, they're basically things that control um, the local heating for the one radiator. Okay. And, and with that, there's a company called Tado that do that. They, that, that works also quite well. Are, are radiators a big thing over there in the UK? Uh, yeah, yeah, they are. They're, they're like, there's like radiators and then potentially underfloor heating is the, is the second uh, most common. Um, I think in the US you have heating uh, air, right? Yeah. So basically, we have um, your you have your AC units and stuff like that, um, and then but you have a furnace usually located in the basement of your house that kicks the hot air up through the same system. Um, mm. So it's, they call it centralized air, but yeah, basically you're when you have your um, and the AC unit on, it comes through the same vents as the here. Okay, well, the radiator here works with water, so it's 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 basically warm warm water, I think forty fifty uh, Celsius inside the radiator tube, and that's what was doing the heating. So it's huh. doing it through water, um, but hey, it, it, I don't have an aircon system, so no, sometimes I need it. <laughs> but it's uh, it's cool. Uh, Cool. Let's move on to the next one then. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, looks like Nicholas here was answered. Oh, let's see. Mm. Oh. All right. So it looks like Nicholas here was helping at answer Esteban's question. Yeah. I think Keith was saying he's uh, he's got the Z, Z wave yet, yeah, but he's he's disliking Z wave. Um, I just dislike Z-Wave. Um, and I, I mean, I could get that. Um, it's Zigbee is a lot easier to play with. Um, and it's a lot more user friendly as far as like, I want to add a bunch of new devices. I just hit the pair button, now I'm plugging them wherever they, they go, you know? Um, but Z-Wave because of, um, what makes it kind of secure. And that's why a lot of locks use the Z-Wave, um, is that it has like a network encryption key. Um, I don't know if you've done a lot with SSH connections or not, but it's the same kind of thing where like, um, if I, I have to have my SSH key to connect to that server, um, Z-Wave networks for the same thing is you have to be a authenticated device to actually work on that network. It's like um, a private key, public key thing you're saying. Exactly. So yeah. like the main idea of that is like, if I get access to somebody's um, lock or Z-Wave something, um, it's not going to be very easy for me to take it and use it or like, let's say, hack that door because I set up a home assistant instance outside my out, out in my car, you know, mm. and now I'm just repairing the Z-Wave lock to my home assistant. It's not going to work like that because of the keys. So like to actually remove a Z-Wave device, it has to hear from the host um, that this, I say, the host has to remove it. So that yeah. way, that way, it's just they're just a lot more secured and a lot better for, um, per, yeah, they're just a lot better as far as security goes. That's that's good. That's good. I guess that's crucial for locks, right? You want it to be right, super secure as much as possible. And that's why you don't actually see any like Zigbee locks or anything like that lying around. Hmm. Oh, cool. Excellent. Awesome. Let's see what uh, I think. Rasby is saying. Guess I'm lucky my wife is always asking me to make automations for to make things uh, easier. 
so yeah that that's that's so awesome that's awesome yeah no and i and i think like kind of to like cycle back to where we were earlier um where you were saying like how do we get people to do it and it's like you ask them what what it can do for them um like is there something that in your life that could be easier well let me try to make it easier for you and i think i think that would definitely get some people to go oh like this is like that what home automation is but i think there are is still going to be quite a bit of people out there where it's like, oh, now this does it. And that's just how that one specific thing in my life is now. Mm, mm. So it is a shared space. That's what I would say. And um, everyone needs, it needs to make sense for everyone. And uh, so I think we've also got Keith, he's sort of uh, yeah, he, the spouse acceptance spouse factor. Acceptance factor. And I think Ransby's a bit over and said the everyone acceptance factor so so we sort of we we seen this from different point of view but i think we're all saying the same thing uh one thing that i'm going to be doing i want to do next week i want to do like a bit of a uh a, a bit of a workshop an automation workshop which i'm going to make it interactive so you guys can get involved and do something online and the idea is we're going to be doing an automation and brainstorm some automation ideas next week so the idea is is how how do we think about automations what can we do right and i know it's something that you might you might jump come along chris too or next week you know we're trying to do something yeah no i, I found so I'm if I'm I'm some ideas out because for me I, I if i don't have any z-wave devices but if there is a z-wave device that i need for me to achieve something i'll get it right like z-wave z whatever i don't care unless it's it's completely uh i probably won't get anything bluetooth because i don't think it's fit for purpose but um it's more uh, for me it's like driven by the purpose the use case what what can we use it for what can we do with it and i think everyone needs to get involved because you probably have people in the family that have different ideas of what they want so yeah yeah you know check uh, uh subscribe to the channel and, and you'll find out more and uh, cool so let, i've skipped that a bit uh could i make it work my bad hold on i think this is about the irrigation system right uh that's what he was asking about yeah. and i'm and i'm not quite yeah. sure he's, he's he's telling nicholas um probably the open weather map wasn't working for him um i don't know i'll have to look more into that one specifically i've never had any reason to guess the future or try to sense the future inside my home automation stuff so i feel like a jedi sensing the future you got some sort of well, i mean that's that's kind of what the weathermen do right and they're always wrong right so, who's 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 worse the weather forecaster or the the guy forecasting the economy right right who, who gets it who gets it right i don't know none of them probably uh hopefully no one forecasts weather or the economy on the live stream <laughs> um so you got keith uh, saying uh home assistant needs something for making good color animations to share uh huey has i connect you and you and third party third party bulbs are more um, than others no i do like that idea um i don't know if you've played with color automations with any lights yet mr geo i've done syncing of lights okay um, so but i'll t touch upon that later i'm really interested to hear this now um it, it's really hard to do automations like that have like changing like colors mm -hmm. like if i wanted to like put a bunch of color bulbs on the front of my house and just use the out of the box home assistant um, to automate the color changing of those lights. Like mm -hmm. let's say every half an hour change to this color and half an hour change to this color. And now I wanted to loop through those colors, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. It's not very straightforward and easy to do um, inside of home assistant. Mm -hmm. But so even if they were to open up a way where like somebody spent the time to actually get a good automation in, and now they they want to share it. I could just go download it. And so I guess I, think, I guess you could do a blueprint, right? Uh, maybe. Yeah, I, I, in theory. Um, but sure. that sounds a bit complex. I think you're gonna need scripting at least because I don't right. know how you choose without scripting, right? Right. Yeah. So that and that's kind of been the problem that a lot of people have trying to do these kind of cool things inside of Home Assistant. Mm -hmm. Is like um, I have a 
built in. Uh, I have a light that has a, its own app and I can do automations inside that super easily. But inside of home automation, it's just, um, I don't know if it's ever been a priority or, or just nobody's ever put the time into it, but um, it is a really complicated task too. Yeah, so I got some Zigbee, um, a Zigbee, so Zigbee bulbs are bought from a, um, it's a UK supermarket called Lidl. I made a video about it and I've got them, they're like the E14s, I think the, the you know, the lamp bulbs and at the Philips Hue lamp bulbs. A problem happens is when I turn on the Philips Hue switch, everything turns on, but those bulbs don't because they're from a different brand, unless I use Home Assistant to turn it on. So they're right. retrocompatible with the app. So if someone uses the app, Philips Hue app, if I want to change the color within the Philips Hue app, you can't. And that those are out of sync. So I created an automation to keep them in sync with templating. I was basically reading the attribute of the um, colors, temperatures, and everything. And then I was uh, passing that value to another automation to change it. Um, I think it's features one of my videos, one of the um, five automations with light. So if you guys want to see how I did that, and the code is linked in the description on that video. Um, but anyway, I mean, it's not a good solution. I mean, I probably got to, would throw out the bulbs. I would have all bulbs of one brand in one location because you want them all to work together. Um, at least I feel, because if there's a bit of a delay, so a bunch of bulbs turn on and then one turns them a little bit afterwards, it's that little flicker. It could, it could, it could be a bit, you know, I don't know. Depends. Right. If, if if someone's a bit, if we're a bit OCD or not, right? Yeah, I get that. Okay, yeah. uh, I got a next one. Uh, Jay, after dark, you should share. Yes, your he, he is absolutely right. Um, but it's all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, when I shared my screen, I had the Nabu Castle link instead of my IP address. Ah, okay. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. But, understand the cost I, I, <laughs> but I, I wasn't consciously thinking that when I had it open. So, but he is right. So, indeed. So if, if you guys can hack my home assistant, kudos for you. Um, I'll just wipe it all because that's the type, type of life I live. So, <laughs> <laughs> you got something to do this evening now, right? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Awesome. Um. We got a nice hi, hi, Ahmed. Nice to uh, have you live. Uh, he also got a question, which there you go. Uh, so, can you explain how to change the blueprint, blueprint YAML to customize it according to my needs? So, um, I think the big thing with this question is we're not quite sure what your needs are. Mm. Um, I mean, maybe you're just talking about in general, um, but YAML is a pretty um, very widely used, um, kind of like a scripting language. So, um, like when I was showing earlier, I had the templating, which was basically Python. Um, YAML is just the same type of thing and it's based off tabs. Um, so if you go into any of your home, um, like your configuration files or anything like that, um, they're going to be YAML files and, um, blueprinting is going to be a lot of the same way. Um, and it, I think it's, kind of gets back to like the scripts type of thing. Um, I haven't played too much with them since the release of blueprints. I've always just kind of stuck to my scripts cause that's what I know. But um, I, I do think it's the same type of way where you just kind of, um, you have like a task, um, you kind of use your YAML to tab out from there. And then as you're doing a new task, you tab back in. Yeah, indeed. And, and I would suggest to add in addition, to go and look at the uh, community tab with uh, in the Home Assistant, and you can import blueprints. Check out my last video uh, about my Home Assistant. You can actually with one click uh, link import blueprints now from like as of yesterday into Home Assistant. So if you're importing oh, a blueprint in that someone else has built, man, I didn't I didn't realize I was out of the loop here. I, I'm not qualified to be on this stream, Mr. Geo. I mean, I mean, it's just <laughs> yesterday. I mean, this is it. it for me. That's the same thing for me. I'm like, that's why I feel I need two people because I can't do it on my own. It's going to be things that I'm not even, I'm not in the loop with. And you, we can't keep up, right? Right. Um, 
there's too many features coming on but um so the last thing i would say is around this is if you're importing someone else's blueprint try not to fiddle too much around with it uh i don't know probably try and create your own one or hopefully you can then share it too right uh, so if we're uh, back on the weather station with Raspberry, I bought a cheap weather station for outside. Um, but it's an accurate, pretty accurate reading. Okay, cool. That's good. If you could share the brand with us, that would be nice. Yeah, no, that would definitely be awesome. Um, I've, I've done some research. There's not a very, there's not very many brands that do tie into home assistant. Um, I think the kind of like the asking price for one that actually looked like it had a good home assistant integration was about 400 bucks which in the scheme of weather stations isn't bad if you've ever priced them out so so I, i'm gonna ask 400 bucks for a weather station right why why do you need a weather state what's the like if convince me right say i don't want to buy a weather i am i I'm, am not i am not that guy um my boss who's also big into home automation he is he's really big into his weather station and he always has been um and so I, I, I've heard a lot of this through him and proxy just because um, we talk about our home assistants a lot together. But he he loves have, being able to, like, know the weather at his house right now. And, like, I think it maybe comes down to, like, like we were talking earlier, like, weather men aren't ever right mm -hmm. and that type of stuff. I think that's it might come to that where it's like, I don't know what, what if what the weatherman is saying is true or not, but I know what's true at my home. And I mean, part, it could be just, you just want to know if it's raining, how much it's rained at your house or what the wind is at your house. Maybe you're concerned about it. I'm not quite sure. I wish I had a better fascination with it. Um, but I think, I do think I'm going to get one set up here so I could try to find that love of the weather station that he has. That's cool. I'm always open to learn because I don't understand the weather station. Um, a few other guys, I think also Chris, from mostly Chris in our live stream, he he's, he he has a weather station. He uses it a lot. So just trying to trying to think about that. That's uh, good. It's good. And uh, let's see. We've got Miguel. Um, oh yeah, this is about the weather station. Yeah, with Node Red. Okay, so we okay. can touch, use Node Red to do automations. Yeah. There we go. Awesome. Here you go. Pay for Nabucasa. I'm a big fan of it. Support support the people that are building these tools. Mm, mm, indeed. Uh, I have to poke it to add the new devices. I wonder if this is the network. Uh, am I, am I, I, he was the one talking about the Z-Wave. Um, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. For the lock, right? Mm. Yeah. And yeah, no, like Z-Wave is definitely frustrating because of the security behind it. You, you got to be like within a certain amount of distance and you have to definitely do the poking. So I, I get it. But at the same side, the fact that I know it has that security back into it kind of makes the hassles of it worthwhile to me. Mm. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mike, uh, I'm trying to think uh, back. Um, so he says, really, I haven't had it die on me since September. Wonder. Did we talk? What do we talk about dying? I don't know. I don't remember. Mike, if you're still, if you're still on the live, um, comment down below. I'll, I'll try and I'll keep an eye on the bottom of the screen to see if pull you in and uh, not make a wait again. Um, okay, Keith, uh, to add new devices to Google Home, not Google Class, you need to run the test again. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was all about the NAST integration. Yeah, so there's a question. I think it was the, I think we covered this uh, from the weather websites. So there's, there's a debate, right? You either get it from a weather website. Uh, probably as the cheapest option and or you have your own weather station so I, I think i think what they're asking here is like is there a way to grab that data um if if we're forming it and as a question and at the end here they say scrape like do they need to go scrape that data 
Well, I think if it depends if they depend on what API it is, right? Right, and so that's what I would say. If if you can find an open uh, an API that fits your needs, um, that's definitely going to be the easiest way to do it. Um, could you scrape that data? Sure. I mean, if you really want to get into it, you could set up a Python script that goes and scrapes any website you want, and then kind of outputs that data into Home Assistant. But that seems like a very out of the way. That seems like a very weird way to go, especially when there are so many services out there that offer APIs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And also, I guess you need to uh, check in with your own location because uh, I think different places um, classify things differently. So the the Apple app um, for weather classifies a rain. You know when they do the rain symbol for the for the day. But if you go on the BBC on the, on the sort of a, um, website or their app, they'll put it as overcast. So the apples, so it's, you, you don't know if you understand what I mean. So there, there's a certain level of range in the day that makes it rain symbol. But if you look at a British um, app, it, it doesn't. It says, oh, but that's overcast, you know, sunny. But uh, <laughs> so the, the accuracy I find also depends on that, depends on the weather. Uh, cool. So we have, uh, yeah, it's not my, okay. So he's from Cyprus because he's from Cyprus. So Cyprus is, uh, sadly doesn't get that much rain like we do. Uh, keep saying he's going to make his own irrigation system when, when he moves. I think it's similar to what you were yeah. saying, ESP home. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's the route I would definitely go if I was going to do it myself. Um, so what's, what's interesting about the ESP home is like, uh, you have, you know, about like Arduinos and stuff like that. Right. Um, but think of like an ESP home as like, a like a kind of like a, let's say like an Arduino that's plugged into our home assistant through like Wi-Fi or something. And so inside of home assistant, you would be able to have access to like an ESP through that, um, integration. And then like, when you say, oh, turn on sprinkler one, it's the thing plugged in the, the plugged into the ESP one or the ESP um, serial port one or whatever like that. Mm -hmm. um, so basically it just it allows you to do like really technical stuff that you would need to know how to do a lot of coding for initially, whether it was through the Arduino or even Raspberry Pi out of the box. But basically it's just a firmware you load onto there and then you just have Home Assistant look at what it's plugged into where on the ESP home. Mm. Cool. Good, good video. Yeah. That, document it, right? Because uh, we need to know for sure. Uh, so yeah, Miguel saying uh, is that they're, they're talking about the irrigation system. Yeah. We could also use Sonoff uh, for, for CH Pro R3 or and, and flash with Tosmoda. Uh, so that's another way you can actually uh, do it. Yeah, and if you actually continue down two more chats, uh, Nicholas actually says he owns a 4HC, so that might actually work out really well for him. And you guys, the community is helping. They're getting there before we get there, which is fine. I know. Which is awesome. We're, we're, we're behind. Awesome. Thanks for the Appreciate feedback. it, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, sorry, before we jump into, uh, we have Mike's one, which I promise I'll, 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 I'll jump back in because he, he had a question earlier about something that died. And yeah, was, um, the and system it, integration that uh, needs to be kicked. And, right. And I think we've, I think that's just like the, if you do it yourself and not through like the Navacasa, um, you have to go into it and every so often and you have to go poke it or do something to it just to keep it alive. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I hope we're all on the same page there, Mr. Mike. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I, if you've never done it before, the Navicast is just going to be a really easy way to do it. Cool. So I think we've got a bit more information about the zones. Yeah. So, and so what it sounds like um, is he has a zone around his house, but let's say his mailbox is just outside that zone. So instead of expanding his zone, to also include that mailbox because now his home circle is also bigger. He has to put a smaller, oh, oh yeah. So I'm going to take a step back here. 
before I, I, I but the ho- default home on home assistant is a set value. You can't make it any bigger. And so if his mailbox does fall outside of his home, he's having to add a second zone oh, for, okay. for his mailbox just because he can't grow the in default home like you can with additional zones. Oh, right. Okay. Ah, oh, I understand. Yeah, no, I get that, and that would be annoying, so. Okay, yeah. So there's a few cool automations with mailboxes, I guess. Uh, uh, I haven't uh, got any, so uh, they're all within the home, so. Um, I've thought about it, but my big thing is, like, the mailbox is out on the end of the street for me, and it's not attached to my house. And so it's like, one, how do I get my a, a good, reliable signal from the mailbox to my house? So that way, like, when I get mail, I'll be notified and stuff like that. And I don't know, I just, yeah, it just seems like more of a hassle to me than worth it. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I've got a couple of thanks. Miguel's thanking, uh, thanking us, or everyone, basically. I uh, love my ESP home Wi-Fi dimmers and plugs super fast. So, you yeah, know, I, I, I want to look into it. I'll look into it. Um, I like experimenting technology and comparing them for sure. So I'll, I'll give it a go too. Um, yeah. So I guess because you've used Shelly devices before, right? I do. I use Shelly devices. I've got three Shelly devices, which I haven't even plugged in yet. Uh, yeah, they're they're a lot like a Shelly device um, for as far, far as functionality goes. Um, basically, um, with the Shelly, it's like usually in between two products, right? Mm. Um, the ESP is more like a relay device. So like for your sprinklers, you relay the power to whatever one is going to be doing it at the time or triggering mm. stuff like that. So uh, you could also use the ESP for your Wi-Fi dimmers and stuff in place of the Shelly. But because the Shelly's do come in a nice little package, it just makes sense to do it for lights. Yeah, because I guess because they're like they're the enclosure. Right. Enclosure. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's stuff that I put in. And uh, I could keep saying, I join your child, figure out a, a nest integration. A doorbell is on the top right to cloud. Is the, no cloud is the goal. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, there's a doorbell that I was looking into as a Unify uh, from the Ubiquiti line. I don't know if you know Ubiquiti, Chris. Um, I, G, I'm, G4 doorbell. I'm actually uh, a big fan of them. Um, so you know how I was talking um, pre-call about a lot of companies coming to Utah? Unify yeah. is actually located, like, I got I to actually see their office from my desk at work. So like, you can go and go and get some, some yeah, something I, and ship it over right to the UK, right? Yeah, I could just go break down their door and tell them what's up. <laughs> YouTube channel, and Geo needs one. Needs one. <laughs> Geo, Geo needs one. I will. I will awesome. keep that in mind. If and I it will see for it. sure work. It will work for sure. <laughs> there you go. No, but that that would be that would have probably been what I would have bought if I if I was started over. Um. So as far as like a local doorbell, um. Man, I, I think Amcrest is the company that makes this security camera in particular. Um, but they do have a doorbell one with a camera as well. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's all local over just your Wi-Fi. So that might be something to look into. I think the company is Amcrest, a, A-M-Crest or something like that. Yeah. Awesome. I think uh, Keith uh, has uh, had to go, but yeah, you can just rewatch the stream. It will be here on the channel. Uh, so yeah, you can just uh, catch up, it's fine. Uh, so we have DRR Reality 1. Uh, speaking of automation, I'm unable to increase, reduce light brightness smoothly. Yes, uh, um, so you know how I was talking about earlier how it's hard to automate your lights? Mm. I think this kind of falls into that category because like, if you go, hey, make my lights go from 1% to 100%. That's a very jolting action where the lights are just going to be on and then they're going to be, you know. Yeah. And so there's no, like, 
ease in or out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but if there was a better way to automate your lights in Home Assistant, you could say, hey, from one to a hundred, maybe over five seconds. Mm -hmm. And it would just like transition better. And so that is a real pain point and I feel you. Mm, we're gonna have to come up with some sort of solution for this, right? And maybe, maybe there is a good one in place since the last time I looked. I mean, like we've mentioned, there's always things changing. Um, I feel there's always things changing. And I'll tell you one thing, the frustrating thing sometimes when I'm Googling a problem and one of your videos come out and you're like, oh God, if it's me, if, I, if I'm one of my videos coming out, like, oh God, no, I wonder if I'm thinking of no. So sometimes, yeah, I feel there's so much good code. We need to dig, dig, maybe on Reddit or Facebook. Yeah, or, for sure. Uh, Home system forum. You need to really dig deep. And that's why I'm quite a fan of bringing a lot of people, a lot of new YouTube channels like your channel, trying to bring so people are aware of it. And, you know, then, you know, we make more videos and try to help people out. Because I feel that sometimes when we finding things, doing research is not easy for us sometimes. So, yeah, I think we're, we're, we're on the theme of uh, colors and scenes. So, um, so yeah, so with the scenes, I haven't played a whole lot with them in Home Assistant specifically. Um, in other apps, they have been great. So, like I mentioned, I might just be talking out of my, my behind here with a lot of my complaints because um, back when I had problems with it, it was – back when I was first getting into Home Assistant and it was like, oh, this would be cool. And then I, it wasn't like the easiest thing in the world. So it's very possible that scenes fill that void for all these people having problems with their lights. I'll have to look into it, I guess. There is no option to change colors in automation. Well, there used to be. It wasn't easy, though. Um, you'd mm. have to call the entity, and then you'd have to call out um, the specific hue value you were trying to do through yeah. like a like a dictionary type thing where it was like inside of some other stuff. It was not very straightforward, but I do believe you could do it inside the automations if you wanted to play with the YAML formatting. Maybe not. Yeah, I think um, you can. Yeah, I believe you can. Um, yeah. What service do you need to call the light, the light turn on again? Yeah, so you turn the, the you call the light turn on, and then so just pass it a new value, a new color value. Yeah, and I yeah, then you'd have to pass in a new value. Probably do the YAML. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question uh, f from DD uh, DR Reality One. Do you guys use Node Red or Native, and why? Uh, um, I mean, I'm a big fan of the native Home Assistant um, automations hub if it does what you're looking to do. Um, I mean, as of right now, I currently don't have any Node Red automations at play or in use. Um, I just haven't had a need for one. But kind of where like the Node Red, to me, you kind of need both. Um, I wouldn't put up my easy to do Home Assistant automations inside of Node Red because that's kind of using like a super complex thing for something easy. But if I had a more complex automation, trying to build that out through the Home Assistant built-in automations would be really painful sometimes. And so it's just kind of like using the right tools for the right jobs. So you kind of have to use both. Right now I'm only using the native though. I'm using native too, uh, but I, I'm committed to spend some time on Node-RED uh, to learn more about it and to, uh, and to then really form an opinion. I've, I've, we've, I've had also Will on, on here on the live stream. We do a little bit of a Node Red comparison. Uh, you can go check out that video for a lot more detail in, into that. We've made a whole video about that with uh, Will. So, you know, yeah, um, there's no right answer between the two. Right. There's no right answer. Whatever you feel better. I think you prefer Node Red. You feel, you feel it's right. More yeah, and I mean, uh, it is nice because, like, especially inside the Home Assistant layout, um, it's very from top to bottom, um, and that's just how kind of, like, YAML works, and that's what all the native automations are built using. But Node-RED is more of, like, 
kind of like nodes so you could go side to side and um, you kind of map it out versus just going from top to bottom, so. Okay. So we got some more information around the, the web station. So EcoWit is the brand. Um, Raspberry oh. is monitoring the outside temperature for humidity and wind. Uh, so they have microbursts, which is bad for electronics should to power the outages. Ah. Hmm. So, yeah, so I think that's the weather station he uses that ties into his home system, right? Yeah, yeah, I think I think that will be a really good use case for home assistant, you know, or smart home tech in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the cheap weather coming. station. Yep. We need to like. But he says it was on. only like 90 bucks, so maybe that's something worth yeah, yeah, looking bucks. into. Yeah. Seems like a good deal. Uh, might be might be worth looking into it, yeah. Um, Fred. And I see you, Fred. Uh, scraping will break over time. I think this is referred to uh, the this one, which was right. getting the uh, weather data. So we did. I, I we talked about scraping briefly, and we did say if they had an API available, it'd probably just be easier. Um, well, let's see. You can, uh, Without an API token industry, yeah. So I, I'm not saying there isn't a place for scraping. I mean, it's an entire industry and people have jobs scraping websites for data because it is such a thing that people do um and it's definitely something usable for something like your home automation stuff if you wanted to go scrape data and throw it into your home assistant um the option is there um but it's a bit it, it's gonna yeah you're, you're gonna have to maintain it and like fred mentioned scraping will break over time just as the websites change and stuff like that so anytime you can find like an API that has pretty, um, that has some structure built into it, that's less likely to change over time or like some sort of a home assistant integration, those are gonna be a lot more consistent for you because if you're scraping a website and they decide to change the homepage one day, um, there's chances your automations or whatever you scrape in that data could change. There's a lot of technology that also to prevent people from scraping um, that is right. in place sometimes get introduced. I agree. We have uh, five, six developers where I work and their whole job, full-time job is scraping data from websites and they have constant problems with things. Certain websites change the way things are and, and they need to rework the data. One thing I would say for everyone really is what happened, what would happen if you left, uh, you know, you went somewhere for a month, would your smart home continue working? Would there be anything like, can you leave it there, let it let it be, and just have it do automation and stuff without you having to fix things? I think that's where I want to get to, to the point where I just don't need to even think about it. If I want to, I want to play with it. But if I'm busy, I don't want to be, I don't want my life to be interrupted. I want my smart home to own me. I right, want, right. And I mean, I think home. that's kind of like the goal um, because like, Sure, when you want, if you want to build out a new integration and you're like having fun tinkering, that is great. But the moment that something was supposed to have worked and it didn't work at that point, now it's a hassle because it's either out of your way or maybe you're interested in doing something else at that time. Um, mm. But yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. It's not easy. It's not easy, but that's, that's I think, where we get to the point where I can you can recommend it to your friend that's bought a couple of smart devices but not really into it into it right right uh, and, and i think that's if if it, if our system can run like that then we'll be, it will be fine no i yeah no and i i think it will get there i mean technology is only getting better and better um but even at the same time i think if technology was better and better already um people a lot of people including probably myself wouldn't have jobs because i mean yeah 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 Especially like in my line of work, I, I do Linux automation primarily. And if things just worked and they didn't need to be automated or constantly fixed, like I would do something once and then I would be out of the job. You know? <laughs> so. And cool. So your question here, Esteban is asking us, where are you running your HASI or, or recommend? I used to run it on a VM on an old clean app. Recently moved it to a Raspberry Pi four with uh eight gigs um i think that would be great i mean i currently run my um 
home assistant on a Raspberry Pi, either three plus or a four. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't remember at the top of my head, but um, it's either either one of the three B pluses or on the four, um, and it's great. I I don't really have any problems. Um, I know that if I'm doing a lot of heavy stuff, like either with add-ons or like stuff like that. Um, it does, it can get bogged down, especially if they have like a lot of web pages they use. And that's why I stopped using the VS code um, mm -hmm. add-on for my home assistant really early on, just because it was a little bit it's heavy. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's, it's not a lot of people are going to have that problem, um, but you do have to be mindful of what you're using. But I, I know a lot of people that run it on the Raspberry Pi 4 and it works great for them. So. Yeah, I've I've made a three four minute video trying to answer this question, uh, depending on what type of person you are and what's your budget. Uh, I'm now currently on an old droid. Uh, yeah. I'm very jealous of that. Good for you. <laughs> I, I I got it, and and that was part of my whole rebuilding home assistant. Um, uh, you know, course that I'm filming. Uh, right. And I'm, part of that is. Is, is 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 getting that hardware and then i have to say it is there is a big difference it's like upgrading your uh, your iphone by two three generations yeah i know and, and i compared mean to my qnap I had, I had it running on a vm on a qnap that i had previously i was doing plex on it i was doing other stuff on it so it was sharing uh resources and now that i, I have it on a dedicated uh, machine it's, it's no it's, yeah no for fine. sure i mean there's definitely going to be the that burst of improvement if you want to kick out a little bit more money and that might be worth it for you um i mean your automations are probably going to work a little bit smoother faster maybe more consistently for depending on how crazy your automations are getting um or how many people you have at your home trying to connect to it at a, at a time because it is a web server but no, uh, and uh, yeah, no, the better hardware is always going to be better, right? But I, I, I actually recommend, my, I recommend the Raspberry Pi for... Oh, do you? If you're starting out. Oh, starting out, okay. If you're starting out and you're not sure if you like it or if you're going to hate it or you can't deal with it, it's the cheapest, whatever the cheapest point of entry is for you is what you do. If you have a VM, just try it on there. If you have an old laptop, put a Bantu on it and try to run it on that. I think... For, for after a while, you then I can always upgrade and very quick to upgrade. Just do a snapshot, reinstall it, half an hour you can upgrade. So yeah, no, I think that's yeah. I think that's that, yeah, that's good advice. I mean, you've heard of all the the photographers. Their their famous saying is, um, if you have to ask what gear we use to take photos, you're asking the wrong type of questions. So like you should be able to just take a camera and go take a picture. Yeah. And, I mean, the same type of thing applies. If you have a way to run Home Assistant and you want to try it out and get started, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Indeed, indeed. Uh, if you have a linked connection, uh, these are the different types of Home Assistant OS right. provides a VM container. Why? So, uh... um, I use the Hasio OS. Um, Mostly just because it's what they open up to the Raspberry Pi as a super easy to download and install image. Mm. Um, I mean, it's worked great for me for the, all the time I've used Home Assistant. So that's just kind of what I've stuck with. Mm. Um, I mean, I think I would love to do maybe some of these other options out there. Um, mm. But at the same time, like it just makes sense for me to have a Raspberry Pi. If I'm going to plug a USB into it, I know I'm actually plugging it into the device. Um, there's nothing fancy you have to do. For me, I would always, I agree, I agree with what you're saying. I would always use the easiest one in my production system. So, and then play around with different versions to learn and, and maybe do videos. But uh, go for the most reliable one for your circumstances and the one that you're more comfortable with. Big friend saying that would be quite interesting. His home assistant only breaks when he goes on holiday. So it must be an automation. It's called the Murphy, Murphy rule, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if something could go wrong, it will. Um, we also call these like 
the sysadmin rules and like i guess you're the sysadmin of your own home automation setups everywhere but like if if you could go to work every day for three years and nothing will nothing everything will just work and then you'll take a day off and then your phone's going to just blow up because something has decided to break what second you walk away I mean, you know this is something that might want to I need to find we need to I need to do, do a bit more research what is actually um, is the most common reason home system breaks or goes down right you know what is it is it a network is it um, S, a, a SD card failures is it because we've that, touched it no that would be interesting um, for me for me previously it was always my smart things integration that I always always have would have issues with and I'd have to reboot the smart things hub because those are the things that actually did my zigbee and z-wave connections and stuff like that so that was always my problem for the longest time um but since i've gotten rid of it my home assistant's been pretty solid as long as the batteries don't die on sensors and stuff indeed there's something quite interesting um i'm pulling up home assistant now and you can see you can see the front door on the garage right and he's right. focusing right there's something odd, right? It's it's nighttime here, but apparently, according to my nest, it's daytime. Uh, it's still daytime. <laughs> I, when my wife saw that, I showed her. Oh, you, you know, I don't know what I showed her. My phone. I had this, and she's like, "Yeah, but hold on, but it's it's daytime. It's nighttime." You it's see, that's home. that's what it looks like outside here. I didn't even realize you were showing me anything weird. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, right? But uh, but it's like, uh, yeah okay this is not working and it's the nest one that is not working which is the one we actually had more hassle bought five spent five dollars for the for, for it right whereas the local ip camera that i have running on in my network on my network has actual you know uh real real timestamps in it and you can see look the garage is is, is you, you can see the timestamp there 23 um 2312 is so, that, that the time step there you can see the time stamp, but i mean you can see it right right yeah i mean i can i don't know what time it is there that but it one. is it's, it's, it's 23 uh 12 p.m it's 11 p.m right so right. It, it's 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 spot on so if, if i if i were to say which one of the two you got to go and buy to a friend right just for that reason i say buy this one because it's Right. It's, it's reflecting live in you in, in here, right? right? What's the value of looking at this and this is five hours delayed? And yeah. if it's daytime, you won't even know because it's day, right? How you, you and there's no actually no time stamper on the on, on this one. Yeah, so no, those things are like I, I, I have used awesome. cameras that were like a even like a 10, 15 second delay, and it would be like so frustrating sometimes because now I, that's on my to-do list to look at and see maybe something i'm doing wrong because oh you always think something maybe i've said it wrong right wrong, wrong and there's a difference between the two but if i look at the two on the setup the same way then you know something's all there um okay cool i think we've got a question here around uh the vlc add-on how we can use it in automation uh, that I don't. I, that I don't know. Um, I'm sure there's ways to. I'm sure there's ways to get creative with it. Um, I guess the, the biggest thing would be what would be your automation use case for the VLC add-on. Um, but I, I don't know what type of automations or integrations VLC has. They're easily easily accessible right at the top of my head. So it says turn your uh, turn your device into a media media player, but I don't know why we. Oh, this is could be useful if you have a Raspberry Pi, and it's connected maybe to a speaker. Right, but would you be able to automate something over to it? Because you probably wouldn't want to run your home assistant on that device if you have it plugged into a screen somewhere, right? Yeah, you wouldn't want to. I agree. It doesn't, yeah. Yeah, I would. It, I would have to know the system, right? But I think that's what you could do. You could use it as a um, a media player of some sort. Yeah, I mean, I mean at, at that something. point, I would just use Plex. Um, if you're going to use use your home assistant as a media player, um, mm -hmm. 
just kind of the right tools for the right job. Um, I just, plus, especially if you're only running on like Raspberry Pi, trying to stream videos and stuff off your off of that could get pretty taxing. Um, but I haven't looked too much into it for sure. So you actually got the a Plex add-on uh, in yeah. I, I've always seen that, and it's always baffled me because it's like <laughs> I would never set up my Plex that way personally, but. I, I don't have it set up. I have another separate uh, separate box. Yeah, I know. I do Actually, as well. Plex needs a lot of hardware, especially you're doing uh, encoding. And if you have anything like full HD or 4K. Oh, so Fred in the comments said that some people use the VLC for their cameras, their CCTV cameras. So you can stream the RTPS stream. On right. The, but my understanding is if the add-on is on the Home Assistant, then that home assistant needs to be connected to a display. So maybe with my old droid, I could pull it uh, off. No, it mine, no right? it, I think it would be more like hosting it. So like I, if I went over to my um, home assistant right now and I had the we VLC. Still need a client, right? No, I think it's a kind of like a web client. I could be wrong though, but it might just be like, um, like my, your home assistant becomes like a VLC, VLC server and yeah, you got, yeah, you might need a client to actually view it. You're right there, um, but they, um, maybe you want to display the stream. But they might, it might have an, a web page opened up from it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know for sure. Cool. That that sure there'll be some some use case. Um, got a question. Uh, who got you guys into Home Assistant? I was a primary Alexa user, but then I found out about local control. Then on YouTube, YouTube I found a, a doctor and followed his uh, guides. I think that's talk disease. Yeah, uh, I would assume as well. And 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 not plugging another tube. <laughs> okay, it's fine. It doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. We're, uh, we're all friends in the YouTube realm. Um, I, well, I, I, I was no doctor, Doctor Z's, um, but uh, he seems an awesome guy. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, no, I, I feel like YouTubers are just like people on the platform in general. Is always they're they're not trying to like discredit anybody or um, give people. They, they're pretty nice people. So yeah, but, we're trying to build the community, right? I mean, we're trying right. to get some share some ideas across us right how did you how, why did you get into home assistant well i'll tell you why and and it links to the reason why uh i created a channel i it's it's to get people transform their homes and and make this transfer i'm becoming a smart home evangelist i just love it so much right at the beginning i bought some devices and had the smart things help and so you know buying some devices and they were working okay they were turning on lights it was really cool voice assistant was good but there was no they weren't talking to each other at different brands and then i initially wanted to go for the home kit route because i'm into ios but then it's so expensive every piece you need to buy it's just right. too much so then you have then you feel you're locked in right if I buy all, all Google devices, I need to be in the Google, you know, if I will buy all this or that. And I just found Home Assistant and I'm like, hey, this works. It links it all up together. You can build your own dashboard any way you want, right? You can customize it. You can have, you can, you know, you know, you see in the movies, the, those tablets with all the nice um, right. cards. And if you look at, um, few years ago, even now, if you get a company to come in and do home aut automation, um, they will cost, I don't know how much it will cost in the US, but tens of thousands of pounds here. To get no. to you know, put the tablets and do all that work, right? No, yeah, no, I, I, if I had to guess, I would say probably you'd be looking up to ten to $15,000 to have somebody come in and do it all for you at least do it as some sort of service but then you'd probably have to pay some sort of maintenance and upkeep on that as well yeah so uh, you know that that's the reason why i got into it and that also is the reason why i started to build these courses 
and I've got a uh, free course if you're new to Home Assistant. And this is the basically the starter course where uh, I've also got a little thing here. This is the reason I got this free course is everyone would say I was doing all these smart home ideas, and people say, "Hey, what's Home Assistant? How do I get? How do I get started?" And then in the past, hey, look at my playlist. But then it became difficult to make. So I've got one place. I've got like a quiz, stuff like that, um, a jargon worksheet you can download. Uh, and I'm adding to that a little bit here and there. So you can, it's free. It's always going to be free and you can just sign up for it. Uh, there's a platform, external platform that is running on and you can you can find it there. And also while I'm here, I'm also going to talk briefly about the, uh, the 15th. I'll be launching the the official launch hopefully of the um building a smart home course so this is going to be the thing that i'm going to be basically saying hey you want to build my own smart home the same smart home i have buy the same gadgets do everything there is a way of doing it because what i find with videos and things you do one video but people don't have the full picture of the whole smart home. Right. did you start with it and how did you get to it and it's it's huge. It's it's, it's took, took a lot of time, and I've split it up by modules. So I've got lights, heating, um, you know, robo vacuum, and I'm gonna keep adding to it. But it, it's an organized way of keeping it. Uh, I find that that is is better, obviously, because of the huge time it takes. Right. No. No. That recording and filming. I'm, I'm sure it's gonna be great. Um, I don't know if I'll be checking it out personally, but I hope. You I don't hope. It, right. I, I hope people. I hope people. Are, it's good for people. So. Yeah, it's going to be good for people that are starting new, right? And, and it will help. So that's that really, that leaded into that. Uh, so we go back to the questions. Let's see. Um, let's see. I wanted a cheap way of opening my garage door. That's how Fred got in. And then somebody says that they use the ONVI. What device do you use? Sorry, sorry. What device do you use, Fred, for, for the garage door? I'll be interested to hear. Um, so what my favorite one to recommend at least is uh, about a hundred bucks. I, I know you could get really fancy ones for about 150 um, and they have their own dedicated apps and all of that stuff out there. Um, but most people, they already have a button inside their home that opens the garage. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this hundred dollar, like kind of like a zig Z wave zig beat button that you actually just snip that garage cable and like put this in between it to like read those signals. Um, I, I don't know what it is at the top of my head. It probably just has some generic Zigbee garage door opener, but that's the one I would recommend if you're interested. Good. Awesome. Um, they're quite, you could save some money, you know, with the garage doors openers. Um, yeah, so he's using the the Wemo Maker, and I do think that's like the one thirty, one fifty dollar one. So but, is that also does that also come with the um, the opener itself? So you um, the, um, the actioning the motor, I don't know how you call what you call it. I I haven't looked that much into it. I know for sure that there's probably I think that it either plugs into the back of your garage opener or it replaces it. I know there is okay. some sort of hub device to like give it the Wi-Fi support so that way you can access it from your phone or anywhere in the world. Mm, mm, indeed. Indeed. Um, so I think as Van saying uh, there's an ONVIF integration that lets you stream IP cameras. Uh, yeah. I, I think this was in regards to um, us somebody mentioning you could use your cameras with the VLC. Mm. Yeah. And so this is just a different way of doing it. I mean, I'm a big fan of just using the RS, R, RTSP if it's available. Yeah. Um, just because it's just bare bones. And sure, you might have a little bit of lag or consistency issues, but um, to me, nothing beats it. Mm. I, I have my uh, the garage door camera integrated with the uh, NVIF. Very good. Oh, yeah. uh, it also gives you some of the sensors, like motion, exposes the motion sense of the of the camera as a um, as a motion sensor. That, that's I might have to check that out. Then that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a good option. 
if it's uh, depending on if it's supported or not. And also, you don't need to store the secret, the RTSPS stream in the right. secrets file. Uh, check it out. It's good. Um, yeah, I think Raspberry's there. Uh, yeah, I know. It's, 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 it's good uh, how we all got into it. I guess we'll never stop, right? <laughs> it might it might be something else. Now it's Home Assistant in 10 years. Time. We don't know what's going to be there. I'm sure there'll be something for us to have fun with. Um, Esteban is saying the ability, uh, this is around the Home Assistant question, the ability to integrate from random protocols is the main reason for many of us. Yeah, and I mean, this just the single pane of glass is just a huge one. Like, I mean, you could have 15 apps or 15 different websites you log into to do X, Y, or Z, or you could just have everything under Home Assistant. Indeed, indeed. And and it makes you more flexible, right? It's if, if a light bulb goes on sale or whatever goes on sale, you can buy it. And right. if you know it's compatible, you can get it. You're not just tied it to one brand, one ecosystem, I speak. Okay, question from uh, Frantisek. Uh, he's saying, have you ever tried running a Home Assistant on a Raspberry Pi Zero W? So I, I haven't. And I, I haven't either. And um, I, I don't think, I, I think that would be kind of like a, a, an interesting use case for it. Um, so the main idea of the Raspberry Pi Zeros is they're supposed to be super minimalist um, Wi-Fi connectivity only there's no ethernet adapter on it um just so you can put them into small places mm -hmm. um and if you have one i would say just go for it um but if you're looking for something to buy i probably wouldn't buy the raspberry pi zero um i don't think they're as robust as far as the minimalist expects that even the raspberry pis typically have but i don't, I don't think they have um too as much specs there. I can see it's like uh, nine pounds thirty. The Raspberry Pi Zero. Is that? Are you talking about price? Yeah, it's it's under ten pounds. So that's okay, twelve dollars US dollars, I think. Yeah. So I've always thought of the Raspberry Pi as like, or the Raspberry Pi Zero as kind of like um, the Arduinos of the Raspberry Pi family. Yeah. Um, they're just very small. They're minimal, you know, they're, they're, they, they're not, they're trying to be um, a small Wi-Fi enabled version of, of kind of like the Arduino where you're not using it to, as a computer or as like a mini computer using it for your automations or to give you your um, IOT internet of things um, functionality um, using a Raspberry Pi. You need an SD card or here. You got the SD card slot. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it wouldn't run Home Assistant, and if if he has one, I would be, I'd definitely be interested to see how well it ran. The, yeah, um, we need to see the breaking point, right? When yeah, we, no, but I I do think those are for kind of DIY, do it yourself, Internet of Things type of devices. So, yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. So, you know, we're getting close to two hours. So I think we're gonna give it another few minutes. Yep, uh, that sounds great to me. Wrap up, wrap up the stream. Um, yeah, Fred got the, he's got the Wemo on the $20. Oh, so I might have been thinking of a different garage device, but that's a, that's a good price. Um, but yeah, I know I think the garage could definitely be controlled to the Shelly if you pl played with it a little bit. Yeah, I've got it in with Shelly. Yeah. Um, it's, it's working really well. Um, I had an electrician come in and do another work, and I got him to wire the Shelly. Uh, he, he was finding it. He never worked with a device like that before. I was like, what is this thing? What are you doing? Um, so I had to explain, you know, what I'm doing and stuff. Um, so I've got a video about, uh, about it. So if you want to find out, if someone wants to find out more about it, uh, but I think it's one of, one of the cheapest uh, f uh, things I've automated around, f again, 15 pounds. Uh, yeah, no, Shelly's, Shelly's are cool. Um, but yeah, the, the, they're cheap and they're small. And so like yeah, new motion sensor, have you seen that? Uh, does, she, does Shelly release a motion sensor? Oh, I'll show you. 
I was sorry. I, uh, I have I have not heard about that. I don't know if anyone heard about it. Let's see. Let me share it. It's too many clicks to share, right? This is, there you go. There you go. This is it. So this is the new the new device. I'm not I'm not a huge fan of it aesthetically, but I'm not, yeah. but I'm, I'm sure it, I, I'm sure it's great. So we've been reading about it and, um, the Wi-Fi is, is, is the thing. So no, uh, how the, the year battery life is the appealing thing to me for sure. And this is the, this is the thing. One of the killer features, right? Battery and, uh, rechargeable battery. And it's got a USB and I don't know which USB, let's see if it tilts. Hopefully it would be USB C at this point in time, right? Dog, I don't know. It's not gonna show me the <laughs> it's not but, No, I no, that is definitely a cool looking device. Um as somebody that has you have used multiple different motion sensors, um the big thing is the battery, um, for me, because like either whether there's Z Wave or Zigbee just I don't know what it is about motion detection, but it's very battery draining for some reason. And like my motion sensors would die, do die long before some of my other sensors do. So look at, look at the price. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that's very appealing. So it's $49. I'm not sure about the size. I can't, I think it's, a, it, it's, Somewhat sizable. I think it's bigger than the right. I would say it's micro would, USB. Yeah, charging. Uh, I would say it's probably about yay big. I mean, that person's holding it in their hand, pretty pretty well. Like for my Google my Google Home here. Yeah, but that's quite big as a motion sensor, right? Oh, I'm, I mean, sure, but it's it's not too bad. But I mean, if you're sticking it to a wall somewhere, um, it's not like it's really going to be in the way of anything. Ah, yeah. So that's 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 another one, um, interesting one to look at. Um, so no, it's good. It's good. That, I mean, this this there's a lot of things to to think. One last piece of advice I'll give before we wrap up is is the right thing might not be out yet. So I found out that I find this all the time, that stuff I'm like, eh, I'm not convinced on it. And you wait three, six months down the line, they release something and, and you can, uh, and you can get it. Um, so we got, uh, Glenn, uh, shout out to Glenn. Awesome. You can do a shout out to Glenn. Hi Glenn. Yeah, th there you go, Glenn. How are you? Thanks for joining the stream. Fortunately, we're going to be wrapping up now, but if you have a question, um, we'll take it as the last question or if anyone else has, and then, um, it's getting close to nearly midnight. Hey, it's, um, it's I know. You're out of control. I'll tell you what, <laughs> at 10 o'clock, my, I'm in bed. Oh yeah. You know, it's doing it for, for, you you know, the viewers, right? You gotta do something for the viewers. Do it, doing, right? it, doing it for the viewers. Going back, okay. going back. Awesome, awesome. So um I think I think we're done here. So Chris yeah, I think so. first of all I wanna really thank you for spending two hours here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for answering the questions and very thoroughly. Uh, appreciate it a lot. And a lot of people I think uh will check out your channel for sure. Yeah. I, I, I hope so. I mean, I, I do do it mostly because I love doing it, but I do love to see people enjoying those videos, you know? Um, so if anybody wants to check out my channel, that would be great. Um, but thanks for inviting me. I had a blast of a time and any, anytime you want to invite me back, I, I will try to make it back. So. I'll, 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 I'll try to get maybe in the future more guests at the same time. Right. No, I get that. So, but I, I'm like, um, like even two get, but I'm like, how how we do two guests and the chat? I mean, you know, multitasking is not my thing. That's why I've oh, I'm smart. So, <laughs> I don't right. need to <laughs> so I think for me, as I get more comfortable with uh, with the stream, uh, it's 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 awesome. Uh, and if you want to support the stream and the channel, uh, anything. 
there are ways of doing it um, so we can keep these streams going uh, because unfortunately this stream stuff isn't free you have to right. pay for the software to do all this all the stream stuff you know so well, it doesn't matter it's fine but if we're having fun that's the best thing that's right best thing. all right well i appreciate you inviting me on also right everyone else please have a, an awesome weekend and next week we're going to be looking at uh i'm trying to plan a fun brainstorming automation session um interactive session with with uh you guys more involved so i'll think about it and see what i can do we can plan it hopefully next week end of next week uh but stay tuned and like and subscribe to both channels and uh, i'm gonna close the broadcast you guys stay all safe and let me close